Chip Flory. I uh, am the lead developer and owner of Scraping Pot of Games, and I currently work for Boeing as a VR game developer. We're also self quarantining together. So. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. We've uh, we've been uh, self quarantining for gosh eight weeks now. Huh. I'm not sick of looking at you yet. That's so. good. <laughs> Well, today's episode is all about gaming uh, and how to turn the skills from, from that hobby that you love into a career. I brought Chip on today as my co-host. He's got some great insider tips and we also have some amazing guests waiting in the waiting room today. So we've got some really important announcements at the end of today's video about what this channel is gonna be going forward. So stay tuned all the way to the end. We have some guests with some amazing journeys to share with you. So I will go ahead and just let them in from the waiting room. It looks like everyone's here. There Hello, we everybody. Well, okay. we, we are Happy live. Saturday. Happy Saturday. Happy There's Saturday. There's really no place I'd rather be on a quarantine Saturday. Welcome to episode eight of King Kong Live. We've been doing this for two months, and I'm so excited to have every single one of you on as a guest today. Uh, we've got some people watching and ready to hear your stories of how you turned your gaming into a career. First off, let's just go around the room and I want everyone to just be able to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Alexa Smith. I'm based out of Portland. I have been working in the video game industry for almost seven years. Um, I've been working for a company called Experis Game Solutions um, at their headquarters in Portland. Um, I really enjoyed working there. It's been really fun uh, working on lots of pretty cool titles, just doing testing in general. Hello, I'm Ariel. Uh, I run a, I'm kind of like dip my toes in a bunch of different facets. Uh, I have my own company called Air Bubbles Cosplay, where I stream content on Twitch. Um, I post cosplay progress. I actually um, have done multiple works actually recently for Wizards of the Coast. Um, I made a Chandra for them last year that traveled to Japan. Um, and then also, but I am in, also in the gaming world and tech world. So I've actually been working um, as a tester uh, since 2014, I think. Um, I've worked at Big Fish Games, the Pokemon Company International, and currently I work at Bungie, um, where I'm a test engineer. So yeah, you can find me lots of different places if you just look up Air Bubbles Cosplay, but primarily Twitch and Twitter is where I'm most active. And to be clear, you got to go with your Chandra costume. Not, you got to go too. Not <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> that was, yes, that was nice. Got to go. It was amazing. Very <laughs> hot. Don't go to Japan in the summer. It's very hot. <laughs> Duly noted. I guess uh, my name is Levi Parker. I am the UI lead at Wizards of the Coast, and I work on a project called Magic Arena. Through the years, growing up, I worked or I went to school for three D animation and special effects for film, and over time, I kind of worked my way through getting jobs at various mobile game studios. I actually started out in the tech industry doing um, web development and visual design for a, a kid's tech product, and then wheeled my way through to a mobile game studio called Idle Minds in Denver. And then in Seattle, I worked at uh, um, another company called, gosh, I forgot what it's called, Idle Minds, and then eventually Wizard of the Coast. So I've been there for the last two years. I've been in the games industry for about nine years total. And now I just do a lot uh, of UI design. My, so my job has slowly morphed over time to do um, visual design for figuring how to get strategy games onto a digital platform. You've been all over the place. Yeah, it's been an interesting ride. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Randy McCurry. I've been in the games industry for over 10 years now, and I've done everything from 
game testing to game art to project management and my current role as a release manager producer working with Microsoft Game Studios. Uh, I grew up in this area and believe it or not, I actually didn't get a start in gaming despite having all of these amazing industry uh, literally in my backyard. I have a formal education in engineering. I did an internship at Boeing, uh, which pivoted towards um, learning game art, which pivoted towards working in the games industry through testing. And now I'm, like I said, uh, just currently working as a release manager, working at Microsoft Game Studios. Kind of a weird journey, but I think everybody on this panel kind of has, has a, a fun story to tell. I think uh, definitely what I've learned just in my short conversations with you all is that no one has had really a great path <laughs> or, or a predictable path even mm -hmm. at all um, in this industry, which I think makes it even more exciting, but super challenging as well. First question, uh, what game or thing inspired your career? Anything that comes to mind? Oh, okay. Um... Thing. Define a thing. Is it a particular part of a game or a, a life game event? <laughs> Sky riding, a, 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 a pet, yeah. whatever, yeah. whatever you want. <laughs> okay, okay, I, I got it. I, I'll go first then. Um, does anybody remember the Game Boy Link cable? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So honestly, for me, uh, I made friends through Pokemon. You see somebody with a Game Boy, and you say, "Oh, I need to actually talk to this person to get the Pokemon that I need from their cartridge." It, it it inspired me and realized that, like, yes, games are a thing I do on my own for my own personal hobby, but when that first conversation about Pokemon evolved the way it did, where I actually had to, like, branch out, um, it kind of made me realize that, yeah, it is this thing that added more to my life. I have a, I have a fun story specifically with the, the link cable. I remember if you unplug the cable oh, yeah. at a certain point in the train, oh, yeah. you could duplicate a Pokemon. <laughs> and I remember I was like, I had caught this Rattata, like level one to trade for my friends, like fifth, level fifty-five Charizard. Yeah, and you I got, and I we, I realized <laughs> after I had just pulled the cable out that we were going the wrong way. Yeah, like, you got <laughs> so you guys so both got this level we, one Rattata. Yeah, and he lost his Charizard and was super mad. Oh no. <laughs> no. I felt awful. As you should. Yeah. Are you still friends? <laughs> Not really. I mean, kind of. It checks out. Yeah. My my draw to like the game industry is is pretty short and sweet, I guess. But like, um, funny enough, when video games first started coming out and like being popular, my mom actually hated them. But now she plays more than I do. You should ah. see how many hours she's played of Destiny that I have not. <laughs> but um, honestly, like Halo was the thing for me. Like it was it was my favorite game. I played it way too much, probably. And um, and it was kind of like this as being like a female gamer, especially in the time when games were new and they were very much um, marketed towards men and boys and stuff. It was like this thing I had to like prove. <laughs> so it was always my goal to like play as much video games as possible and be really competitive and be like, yeah, that'll show them. And um, I even like won the next video game champion female in my senior year, like yearbook thing. <laughs> right. So um, it was just kind of like something I was always drawn to. And um, it, it was kind of like empowering for lack of a better word. That's but yeah, awesome. that's, yeah. So just super cool. Yeah. So Halo is that like a religious game or something? I don't. I don't really know. <laughs> I <would> agree. <laughs> well, and that's it's actually pretty cool. Is you, you kind of paved a way and in, in a, a way of self identifying and and having pride in this thing, which as you mentioned was was not a you know widely uh, gamer girls were not a, a prominent thing at that time. Is that a correct assumption? I would say that's pretty correct. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot more now, so yeah. So for me, it was a, it was not so much a draw to games. It was an inexplicable draw to art. Um, at a young age, I had a some weird fascination with fantasy and dragons and you know armor and swords, like. But it wasn't cool to be into that stuff as in my young social circles because there are a lot of kids who are into sports and you know being a man. And I was like, I like, like castles <laughs> so um there's a different definition now of being a man 
Yeah, for sure. Nowadays, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that, that's... That phrase isn't valid word. anymore. Yeah, nerd, I think nerds came out on top. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think it worked out. But yeah, games were an outlet for um, kind of using games as a vehicle to get to the art fix that I couldn't really describe or explain to my friends. Um, led me to play a lot of... Blizzard games were a big influence. Um, Warcraft and uh, Warcraft 2, Starcraft. And then um, Magic cards ended up being interesting but only after getting into Pokemon cards. So same thing, same thing with Brandon of, you know, Pokemon had that childhood wonder draw that slowly navigated me through to where I am now. Yeah, I remember uh, Blizzard cinematics growing oh, up. Yeah. They were just, I mean, it was, it was next level what they were able to do and, mm -hmm. and the uh, realism that they were able to bring to it. But also the style that they had with everything. I mean, I still remember... Uh, Arthas walking the return home cinematic and all of the the detail that they had in that such a an amazing artistic achievement really for digital character design just so cool yeah Absolutely. and it was unprecedented too mm -hmm. like the fact that they put all that effort into it when no one else was was um, and, going outside the box at that time for sure and i don't want to do too many name drops matter of fact i won't do any uh but levi and i <laughs> actually know um one of the head founders of the the cinematics group over at blizzard and just the inspiration and the drive it just was like this perfect culmination of technology was just close enough to being where they wanted it to be and then they just pulled the trigger and did it and because of that the angles they shot how they they you, you described like the arthas returning home cinematic there's a lot of fun little tricks that they had to do, which you look at now and they're really iconic. But at the time, it was just what they had to do with the limitations of technology. Um, but yeah, very inspired. I mean, like you, I, I like reminisce of seeing the uh, StarCraft II cinematic, or sorry, the StarCraft One cinematics, like when the Zergs are attacking oh, yeah. and how they shot that, the lighting. It just gives me goosebumps even, even now when I watch it. Mine is a very generally short story, just like Aaliyah. Or not Aaliyah, I'm sorry, Ariel. I'm thinking uh, she's Ariel. awesome too, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ariel. Um, so I played video games ever since I was a kid, starting with the original PlayStation and the Game Boy. Um, but the game that really did get me into gaming in general was Halo. Um, so my dad and I played it all the time. It started with the Halo demo that was only available on a disc from a specific magazine <laughs> with like 12 other games in a pack. <laughs> and we, and it was Assault in the Control, uh, no, I'm not, uh, Silent Cartographer. And my dad and I played that level hundreds of times. And then we learned there's this scene at the end with Johnson. He's like, so you beat the Halo demo. <laughs> we learned that verbatim. And we would say it with him <laughs> as we completed the demo. And then eventually my dad bought the full game and brought it home. And we would just spend hours all day. My favorite thing from that was we were trying to beat the game on Legendary. The library sucked. Mm -hmm. as most as most mm -hmm. halo players would know library sucks on legendary um but we were on the last level it's the warthog run trying to get to the end before the everything explodes and my dad he was the one i'm seven years old and my dad's trying to drive the warthog to the end he keeps <laughs> crashing we keep failing mm -hmm. we keep dying we keep restarting and so my dad, he basically does, like, the original rage quit. <laughs> He's like, I'm not doing this anymore. So I'm like, Dad, let me try. Like I'm, so, like, I'm just like, I'll do it. And I suck at Gran Turismo. Let me try driving the car. And so I got it my first try. Wow. <laughs> and my dad was so mad. <laughs> he was just like, my seven-year-old just beat me. It's like but, rage quit on top of another rage quit. Right, right. Right. I'm <laughs> done. <laughs> And so it all started from there. It became this borderline unhealthy obsession with Halo. So two, three, ODST, Reach. Um, went into college playing Reach all the time. And I went to my first full-length convention, Emerald City Comic Con. And that's where I had my first, um, not my first, but like my second Halo costume. I made my first in high school. And that's where I met a guy who became friends with me and then referred me to Xperis about a year later. Uh. So 
very short story on how I got into the video game industry. I didn't even know what I was getting into. <laughs> I was just a cashier at Michael's and I was just like, I don't know. My current job sucks, but I'll try this. I'll do anything and else. Here I am sure. seven years later. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I remember a lot of uh, friendships um, in, you know, that, that time that we were growing up, I think we all were growing up around the same time, were forged or uh, fractured by Warthog experience. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. The, the maker and breaker of friendships. Mm -hmm. If you didn't do Warthog jousting, you didn't play Halo long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my question is is kind of moving forward. When you had that first interview you know, for your job that wasn't a cashier at Michael's, how did it go? For, for me, this story is very, uh, it's not your run-of-the-mill interview path. Um, the, the, the narrative you hear in college is it's going to be really hard to get an interview. You're going to have to put your resume into 20 gigs. You're going to have to get rejected a lot. And for a lot of people, that's true. Um, I actually, I did, ha I did put my resume out to a lot of places for the 3D, uh, 3D animation and special effects degree that I got. And the ironic part is, despite all those efforts, my interests in what I was putting online didn't quite up, uh, line up with my degree. And so I would put on um, 2D animation. Um, I'd put, I did flash animations. I, I had them on new grounds. And I was noticed, and I grew a, a small following through that. And so that's actually where I got my first job offer was through doing contract work for um, 2D stuff and more kids focused design. And then through that process, I actually got hired by a, one of the people I was doing contract work for. So um, they contacted me and basically said, Hey, we got funding. If you want to, you know, drop everything you're doing as, you know, just a fledgling out of college and just drive up across the country to Colorado. I had originally lived, I grew up in Florida, um, packed my bags, flew up there. Um, it definitely wasn't exactly games. It wasn't the path that I assumed would be, you know, oh, I got the job at the game studio or a job at the big movie production house, but I knew it was a good first step. And I knew that I was going to be able to cultivate my skills. So being able to contribute creatively to a smaller product or a tech product when we're on the job was my in. And it was, it ironically helped me appreciate jobs outside of games and opened up the scope and kind of the perspective I had on what I wanted to do instead of my, you know, my focus being so narrow. That was my first experience. And then organically through that, you know, mobile studio, Wizards of the Coast. Well, yeah, you're about as far from Florida as you can be right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's metaphorical, it's poetic, I think, <laughs> but uh, it worked out. Yeah. So something that Levi said, which I think is really important, is the perspective outside of games. Uh, as I mentioned, I was doing a uh, internship at Boeing prior to joining the games industry, and it was really bizarre, um, mainly because you know, growing up in this area, everybody knew somebody who worked at Boeing, and you know, I. I just kind of transitioned into this. Not that it was easy to get an internship there, but um, one thing that I noticed when I was working there was you walk around and you see uh, cubicles and everybody has their, uh, their hobbies, their, their things that they're interested in. And when I was there, I always assumed that I would have colleagues who had model airplanes and all sorts of interesting, cool aeronautical nonsense. But a lot of it wasn't, and you know it was really kind of shocking to me. And of course, uh, as a person with multiple hobbies, I thought, well, why don't they pursue any of these things? I was I was um, in a unique area in my internship where I would go onto the assembly floor, take pictures of of problems that the uh, that the, the the assembly floor was having, and then we would write up reports and then send it back to the engineers who were designing the parts and whatnot. Um, without getting into too much of the complexities of this, this led perfectly into my first job, which was in testing, where in testing, you pretty much just write a bug report. Um, and so during my interview, uh, I was very, very terrified. I had a lot of close friends that currently worked on the team that hyped me up, submitted my resume, 
And so the guy pretty much was going to hire me unless I screwed it up. And luckily for me, I was able to pivot my experience at Boeing into catered game test kind of talk, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, there was a bug with the assembly line airplane. And by the way, the thought of having a bug on an airplane, Mm. knowing game testing is just terrifying. But um, during that interview, there was actually a fire drill, which was chaotic and nonsense. (laughs) We literally were continuing uh, the interview process, walking down the stairs with hundreds of other people. Uh, but it was, you know, it was it was interesting. It was unique. And, um, you know, looking back even farther than that, I, I can't remember exactly how I acquired this, but I required a VHS tape of the making of Yoshi's story. Oh, wow. It actually <laughs> talked about game testers. And I was like, wait, what? Is that a, is that a real job? And, <laughs> of course, it is nothing like you would imagine. Um, we could, we, I think everybody in this panel could talk about how buggy games can be and how chaotic the game development process can be. But it was, you know, it was, it was a fun experience and um, that fire drill. <laughs> hey, I mean, at least they'll, they'll uh, said something embarrassing. They might've just forgotten about it. That's true. Yeah, it was like, hey, do you keep calm under pressure? And I'm like, well, there's a siren going on right now. There's hundreds <laughs> of people. Oh, where were we? Oh, you just, you were just gonna, you just offered um, Valerie. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good move dojo move i'll remember that one yeah <laughs> pull the fire okay, alarm before in, the interview go starts. in in 10 minutes and pull the fire alarm <laughs> yeah. seems fine yeah mine's like kind of this this is something i've learned over time is like everyone knows each other in the industry so that's kind of where my story begins it's it was i was working at best buy and i primarily worked in like the the gaming section when it was a thing it's not really anymore but uh my brother-in-law was like, oh, I know someone that works at Big Fish Games who wasn't even in any part of like testing or tech, really. They were in like art, so they didn't really help me get a job. But you know, when you can throw a name out, it helps. So Thank like, you. that's what started with that. And I was in customer service. But what got me into like specifically testing is um, something happened where like an update on iOS broke like all of the games so like I was answering mobile tickets there were thousands of them and I was the only one answering them so it kind of made me start like testing to figure out like well how can I get around this crash that they're ha- they're seeing and things like that and then writing steps for them to do and um, I was like wow this is kind of interesting so um, I ended up being if my boss helped me then move up into doing game testing at the company. And then it kind of just like went out from there. Um, so um, it was very interesting being like brand new, like starting like a um, tech org, being like some of the first testers. And I learned so much doing that. But um, ultimately I did want to work on a game I was like a lot more passionate about, which is like um, now Destiny. Um, so working at Bungie was kind of like something I'd been trying to do for many, many years, which I did do by myself. I, did, I, I know people there now, but <laughs> I did it by myself. So, but, um, one thing that's funny is my interviews, this is so bad cause it makes me sound terrible, but every interview I've had and a job I've gotten, I was late. Oh no. No, so, <laughs> um, don't be late, but it's been working for me. So <laughs> maybe that's your lucky charm. I I don't know. My first job in the tech industry, I was late and my debit card got stolen. So, <laughs> that was, but I got the job. Yeah. Uh, Ariel, I I remember that your mom plays Destiny. So mm-hmm. has she ever reported bugs directly to you? Um, as a joke, they will. My mom and my sister and my brother in law will be like, "God, Ariel, what what, what are you doing? Fix this? What, what are you doing?" doing? Oh. I was like. But I specifically deal with like software and web testing, so you can tell me everything you want about the game, but I don't test it. I will so. piggyback off of off of something you said, which um, even outside of I don't work in the game industry, but something that I've started to no matter what industry you're looking at, go to LinkedIn, find people who work there, and just ask to talk to them. Like I met with probably six different people at the company I work with now that have nothing to do with the job that I do. But I just was like, hey, can I meet with you and hear about what you do? Can, like, do you have 10 minutes? Can I buy you a coffee? Like, just chat. And almost every single one of them said yes. So it's really was a tactic that I just started doing. And I was like, I want to find out more about your company. They're like, hey, you know, I think, I think that you should talk to this person. And almost every single one of them referred me to 
another person. Absolutely. And it really is a small industry. So once you know one person, they may move to a different company and then talk about you there. Yeah. So it word travels very fast. <laughs> Someone in the chat was asking if this industry is different, um, like getting into the video game industry is different than getting into the board game industry. I have, I have industry experience with board games specifically. Um, that was actually the second job I forgot to mention. Um, it was called Direwolf Digital. They translated board games into digital products. So that was, among other things, that was a primary part of their business. Um, ultimately, it does depend on what field you're in. I was a graphic designer and artist, so I did a lot of board design and card frames and icon design and working with designers to build that stuff. And that's not going to be everyone's experience. But by nature, the analog board game industry is much more, um, there are a lot more grassroots efforts. Um, yeah. The stakes are, you know, subjectively smaller. Um, but when you work in a digital platform, you're going to be having to deal with more people, bigger teams, a higher skill cap. So there's a lot more education that has to happen before you ha can actually apply your skills to anything. Um, with board games, I find that there are a lot more startups and there's a lot more ingenuity and creativity, which I really appreciated. So you kind of, you get a different flavor of experience. You're, you're kind of going to get what you pay for. Yeah, so it's... And the skills do translate from one industry to another. You know, games are games. So developing a board game, the skills that you will acquire, could very easily translate into skills to develop a, a digital game, at least from a, a design perspective and balance perspective. You know, stuff that's categorized for design. Um, as a matter of fact, I worked with some very prominent board game designers uh, while I was working in the games industry with them, and I didn't realize that they had Moonlit on the side as board game developers until I saw them at PAX. A uh, very <laughs> small world. I was like, oh, how are you involved with these guys? I love these guys. They're like, oh, it's our company. And my mind was blown. Um, I actually got put into one of their board games. It was kind of this whole small world fiasco. Yeah, have you seen it? No. <laughs> You've not I, seen it? I would love to, though. Um, yeah. I've got a giant framed picture of myself from the board game. I'm going to go get it real quick. That it's sounds great. On a technical, on the technical aspect of testing, I flopped. <laughs> um, the guy who I met who referred me, he was a test engineer at the company. And he kind of gave me like this cheat sheet of what kind of questions to expect. But I had never had to apply myself in a problem solving or critical thinking kind of way. Because I only, I was only a cashier. That was my only job that I've ever had. So I've never had to think that way. Um, one thing that I do remember from my interview, um, aside from my interviewer asking me all these technical questions, like, what kind of testing is this? Do you know the difference between these two, two things? He asked me, what is your favorite video game? And so at the time, I was just like, well, it's Halo Reach. <laughs> and he goes, cool. Describe to me the entire opening sequence of the first cinematic of the campaign to as much detail as you possibly can. Oh, wow. And you're like, got it. <laughs> I got word vomited all <laughs> over the place. Just nailed it. I had the planet. I had the time of day. I had the vehicles, characters, what they were doing, armor configurations. Wow. Help, nice. All of their words, all of their uh, VO that they had verbatim, even down to the stupid drum line in the beginning of the game that goes. Da, 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 da. That's, that's <laughs> I was very drumming important. it on the table, and the interviewer stone faced the whole time, <laughs> not a single expression. And that was the end of my Just interview. <laughs> he was like, "We're gonna call you in a couple of weeks. We'll see Aww. how." That's and so I'm just like, I effed it up. I ruined it <laughs> like, and so i i went home thinking i did the worst and then i got a call the next day going can you start tomorrow oh my god nice. like, um, yes <laughs> well, i think and attention to detail is really important it yeah. really is Sounds like you nailed it yeah and like i said before like i had kind of an unhealthy obsession with halo so i watched all the cinematics all the time I'm very into art and character design that's like my top 
like comfort zone and I understand those things even though I never went to school for it I was still in college when I got the job I was one term away from graduating and I dropped college and I ditched my other job just get into this job because they didn't need a degree to be a tester it was really cool like I thought I failed it and then I got called back the next day going when can you start so I must have done something right yeah I think you did a couple of things right well my my first experience was maybe a little different uh I, I um I kind of happened into it my uh your friend uh Greg Curran and I at some point uh about halfway through the playthrough, he's like, hey, I've been playing a lot of games lately, and you know, now that uh, the Unreal Engine is free, I've been talking about game development for years, and I really don't have an excuse not to get into it. Uh, and, and I had started, you know, like messing around with like custom campaign StarCraft uh, way back when I was a kid, like I think I was eight when I started doing it. Uh, and I think I had tried my hand at RPG Maker when I was, I don't know, 14. Played with or with a couple of di other different systems, and so I've always had this sort of interest. And in, you know, I s stupidly say, you know what, I I think I'm gonna help you. We, we just started doing it. We we started making um, this little tower defense game. It wasn't very fun. We wanted to start very simple, and then we went the other way and had this grand idea. Like we're gonna do, we're gonna do. There's going to be this completely dynamic world and everything's going to change and we're going to, you know, make the next... It's going to be magic. Yeah, there's going to be magic everywhere. We're going to fly. Yeah, we're going to do all of it. It's going to be great. <laughs> and then we very quickly realized that this is way too ambitious for two mm. people who have very, you know, little practical experience in game development. So we have our project and then we halved it again and that was too much. Uh, but we still, um, you know, we... we started working on this, not knowing if it would go anywhere, you know, had a concept of, okay, we want to play as a wizard um, and want to have completely dynamic magic and wanna have, uh, you know, just really great visuals and destructive elements. That's, that's where we're at. And we just started posting to Reddit, just showing like, Hey, this is, this is what we're working on. Is this seem like something you're interested in? And the, the response was overwhelmingly yes. Uh, super positive. Um, that was actually how we ended up forming a lot of our team. Sound uh, engineer and, and music uh, designer, our UI designer, or uh, UI artist. Friend of a friend, I showed my project to him and he was like, oh, do you need, need an artist at all? Like, what I went to school for, for video games, a 3D artist. I'm like, it's because I can't <laughs> do art. Yes, <laughs> Great. Four years later, um, they I guess two or three years later game released we started uh we started in march 2015 released in august of 2017 about 30 months of development funny to hear your story about um finding an artist and how excited you were because i've been on both sides of the fence where i've worked with a primarily an engineering team and then in school i was primarily around artists hmm. and it's really funny how both sides don't at least in my experience, don't know how to connect with the other half of the equation in order to build what they want and collaborate. So when I was in school, I assumed that engineers were a very rare commodity. Um, and so when someone knew an engineer, it was a big deal and everyone talked about how do you work with this person. And then when I got into the games industry, it was primarily engineers and no one knew how to contact artists. So it really goes to the <laughs> point about how um, connections really do make a difference. Right, knowing people, knowing uh, who is passionate and who has the skill set you need to collaborate with it. How do you maintain or prove your value in the workspace? What do you what do you bring into the table here? A deep question. I know it's it's <laughs> an incredibly complicated one, depending on who you ask. <laughs> yeah. Go with it, yeah. But it's important. I mean, because I think this industry is competitive. For me personally, it's been uh, be flexible. Um, games demand a lot of things, uh, especially uh, to bring it back to the board game question. Um, on a smaller team, you're going to be asked to do a lot of things. Um, while there is a designated designer and designated artist, and designated um, UX designer or engineer, the best products end up being a product of collaboration where everyone understands everyone else's professions enable, uh, and they're able to enable 
them to do their job easily, quickly, and effectively. And so understanding a little bit of everything, regardless of whether or not you feel that it was your primary passion, keeps you integrated into a team and a collaborative kind of soul. Um, I've worked with a lot of people who also have a very myopic or like straight laced or straight and narrow understanding of what, exactly what they want to do. And that ends up being kind of the hindrance from them developing into a full kind of contributor that they need to be in order to get to where they want to go. The term generalist, uh, pretty important in the game, gaming industry. Yes. Learning everything, not, not having any real barriers to, you know, like I, like I had mentioned, I, I'm, I'm not good at art, but I had to at least get competent so that when some things were handed to me, I could speak to them or at least tweak things if I needed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've gone back to school twice um, since joining the games industry, once for arts and then the other for project management. And, you know, you never stop learning. Technology is always growing. It's always changing. So you have to be adaptive and you have to be flexible. Yeah, piggybacking off of that, I think the flexibility is definitely the biggest thing. Um, but also uh, just, I, I haven't really felt the need, like I have to go back to school or anything, but I've been able to kind of at least learn terms. So at least I like know like what the engineers and devs are saying to me sometimes if they're like, we found this bug and then they vomit to me in speech, I don't understand. And I'm like, that's cool. Can yeah, you the please? flux capacitor <laughs> needs to be recalibrated. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, yes. Flux uh, capacitor, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I've been at least learning, like, terms to be able to help break down those things for myself. But also, like, don't be afraid to ask questions. That's, like, the biggest thing is, like, you're you, unless you're not bothering anybody, like, they, they and anyone on your team wants to help you. Um, and, and this is specifically coming from a test perspective, but I've worked with, like, I used to work very closely with, like, a marketing team at Pokemon. I worked with, like, PMs all the time, and I worked with artists, like, very closely on the first gate or the first app that I released. Um, but flexibility, um, this is going to sound super cheesy, but, like, positivity, <laughs> I've learned is a really good thing to have because uh, things can happen in a game. It gets delayed. There's a big bug like the community is unhappy but like positivity internally can help exude externally um i know that's like the stupidest thing to say ever no but like, it's, it's, it makes sense it's yeah. emotional contagion and if you're optimistic it can transition to your colleagues yeah and i I'm the games industry is full of passionate creative people and so it's let's you know something big could be devastating even more so if people know that their passion is riding on the line. Exactly. I worked with a team, I'm not going to name any names or where it was or whatever, but like there were a lot of people who were quite negative. So it made sometimes like it really difficult to want to like continue the project when there was so much negativity, but I would like try and like really be positive about it, even if I knew <laughs> it wasn't going well. But uh, yeah, and... I think that that's kind of what I found, at least for me, finding value in that is positivity, flexibility, but also still being true to yourself. Like when we say flexibility, like uh, it's, it's not necessarily being like, yes, I'm gonna drop every plan I have to go do this thing. It's like, you know, your boss and your colleagues, they, they want to see that you also have passion and a life. But um, I find that when I talk about like my cosplay work or a convention I'm going to, um, my colleagues and boss are like super excited and they want to hear about it when I come back. Um, as a tester, like, you're always told, like, you have to get your bug numbers in. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have to have lots of bugs. Um, but ultimately, it's not to maintain your position on a project. It's not just the bug numbers that you have. It's also the quality of your bugs. Are they easy to read? Are they easy to understand? Uh, do you ultimately problem solve the issue to understand the root cause of what the problem is? Um, so not just higher amounts of bugs, but being able to bring those quality bugs and finding bugs that impact the, uh, the title more. Um, for example, one tester could write 100 texture seam bugs and then another tester could write 20 crash bugs. They're probably gonna keep the tester who wrote the 20 crash bugs because they found the more important issues than the tester who's like, I found 20, uh, 100 texture seams. What is the text? 
so let's say oh. you have a, yeah. a sphere and you have a material applied to it. Um, at some point, it could be that oh. when you've wrapped this texture around the sphere, it's like, Wah. yeah, you'd see yeah. that scene. Like if you're wrapping a Christmas gift and you have these really cool, like, candy cane images, and where the scene meets at the back, if those candy canes don't line up perfectly, it's perfect it's metaphor. I basically just throw the present in. The <laughs> I don't even know. You should. Like, Sometimes well, you have to. You just cut your losses. Right. <laughs> nope. I'm not opening this. Not worth my time. <laughs> But but bug quality and bug numbers aside, um, in the testing world, they really look for people who have deep inter um, interpersonal relationships with their colleagues, who are willing to mentor and guide their peers, either it be looking in a specific area of test or how to write uh, bug uh, reports. Um, also, like raising your hand when someone goes, hey, do you want to check this telemetry task? And no one else wants to do it, you'll be like, hey, <laughs> just being that person to step up and go, I can do it. Um, it adds to that flexibility, but also you want to be able to stretch out into worlds that you're not very comfortable in. So like myself, I'm very art content characters. I'm very central to that, but I can also go into some code and, um, and look for issues in there. Um, it took a long time for me to get to that point, but once I started learning other things outside of my comfort zone, then I was retained for longer periods of time because I was willing to do those things. You mentioned, um, you mentioned, uh, in short, being awesome to work with, whether or not it's just being <laughs> helpful or being friendly. Um, and since this is a small industry, like that goes miles and mm -hmm. being able to to stand out as i want to work with this person again i could you know uh, i've got a handful of people that i would just love the chance to work with again because they stood out they were, went above and beyond what was expected or they did something maybe not even related to the project maybe it was something like a silly birthday fiasco nonsense uh that stuff means a lot especially again when you're working with a lot of creatives a lot of passionate people yeah and going back to the flexibility theme, um, when you're, to answer the question, trying to bring value either to get the job or to stay on board, um, making games and creating, or sorry, creating games and playing games are two very different worlds. <laughs> um, that is a distinction that I feel gets lost in translation a lot. And so there are a lot of game enthusiasts who come in who are able to describe how they enjoy the game or what the game brings to them as a player. But from a professional perspective, being able to say, I understand what it means to author these things instead of consume them is incredibly important when we're interviewing at Wizards because it illustrates that they understand that there are going to be parts of the job that are not the same experience as opening up the game and consuming it. Um, you, when you're in production, you have to be a, you know, an organizer, a critical problem solver, you know, being able to coordinate you know, say Alexis's bugs and deliver them to the right people in the right priority is not the same as being good at a first person shooter, right? Um, and while you're gonna be consuming that product and developing that product and you have passion, you're able to bring that to people, it is not, it's definitely not the same thing. And so realizing that is, I think some, it was one for, huge first step that I've had, that I had, and I think, in a lot of conversations I've had with friends who ask me about the game industry, that's kind of the base assumption is like, oh, you play video games for a living? <laughs> <laughs> and so... No, I play video games and make no money, but I right. do this, and, and this makes me... <laughs> this well, makes me money. I mean, we laugh, but when I was a kid, I didn't think that you could just make money off of playing video games, yet, good God, if I jumped on that streamer bandwagon early... Mm -hmm. It's a completely different animal. Um, I know that you had something earlier. I don't know if you forgot. Oh, it. <laughs> no, no. It's just um, uh, what I think what I, um, the way that I add value, not so much to personally, but to our, to our games is by being available, being willing to communicate, um, 
with our, our players in, in, in whatever situation. So it, it could be uh, you, you got a negative review. You know, there are some toxic gamers out there and times they're just posting, you know, they're, they're having a bad day and they're taking it out on your game. Being willing to listen for the complaint, even if it's, if it's a tear, you know, like, oh, this game is garbage. You shouldn't charge money for this. I can't, I'm offended <laughs> that you would even ask that. Um, you know, the aiming is terrible and the textures look like crap. Okay. Well, there, right there are some legitimate complaints. <laughs> and you can engage with that and say, hey, you know, like, I'd love to talk with you more about your issues with aiming. Here's my email. And it's funny how a lot of the people giving that feedback, especially for larger studios, don't think that their feedback is going to be heard. My desktop at works is actually a Reddit thread that's called Watsy Your UI Sucks. <laughs> <laughs> is that the one that I found? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone who comes to my desk always gets a kick out of it. But uh, it is it's part of the job, like kind of browsing for hate and going like, where is this pain coming from? How do we make the product better? Right. But not, a lot of that feedback is not positioned as like constructive. It's strictly just the selfish, like this is the worst thing ever. I can't believe that someone would think this is a good idea. You know? I mean, like to like testing, like one of like the biggest things my boss like said during my interview process was like, uh, we want you to think like a customer, like a consumer. We want you to be able to find those kinds of things to make sure we're delivering something top notch. But I kind of wanted to give a tiny little nugget as we're all talking about different aspects of the the game industry because we're all do we all do something different. Um, if you're not in it yet and you're trying to understand how you can be valuable and like get the job and keep the job and whatnot, it it's helpful to talk to people that maybe have a, the position you want like um talk to them about it because then you might be like i actually may not be able to do that so i'm going to talk to this person over here because testers all every role is different at every company it's different i've never had to do a bug count ever like so that's going to be completely different from alexis experience my experience i if i don't write a bug in a day it doesn't matter like um so it totally depends on the company and your job and the position so it's very helpful to try and talk to people politely don't like bombard people but yeah then you then that can help you build um your value in in getting creative with what you know you have skills with mm -hmm. games are large nowadays you've got marketing teams you've got community management you've got like even people who do create the the get hype videos um these people that i've met don't have traditional uh knowledge in in you know, video games. They've pivoted whatever they've done outside towards video games. Uh, one of my favorite uh, groups is like the lawyers because they have, uh, you know, very unique views of things, but they're gamers and they work in the game industry. So they kind of will be able to geek out with some stuff and then use their terrifying law terms to describe things that we shouldn't do in games. <laughs> uh, before we move on, I have a question from the chat. Are there any games? Um, that help teach clients? Huh? Oh, that is a perfect question. Actually, um, I've been trying to get more involved with the Seattle area uh, games industry. We're trying to pivot and target ways to use things we've learned with gaming to teach. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but I could name every 101 Pokemon, their typing, when they evolved, what moves they had, but I couldn't learn the periodic table. And it didn't make any sense to me. Like, how this could be and it just comes from how we approach things the human brain learns in a very predictable manner but the way we teach is it's different for everybody i suppose but we can leverage the joy and excitement and adrenaline rush that kids get out of playing video games towards something more or, or uh, oriented towards education um there have been educational games in the past that have been relatively successful but uh, who who here played Oregon Trail? Oh. Like, I didn't, but I knew friends that did. And I learned more about the Oregon Trail through that game experience. And if we could tap into what makes games awesome uh, and, and use it in the edu educational system, I think we'd get smarter faster. Well, and I mean, I've seen gamification all over the place. There's gamification of apps like Uber and Lyft. Um, you know, I drove as a Lyft driver and that gamification, I was like, sure, I can drive for three more hours because I oh, see cool. that instant gratification. Specifically answering this question, I just did a quick Google search 
and there's a, a website called sciencegamecenter.org and it actually has a ton of games listed on there. It lists what area it deals with, um, what age group it's intended for, the cost and where it's available. It's a super awesome resource that I just did from like a quick Google search, but the resources are out there. I think a lot of people, I mean, there's Minecraft for STEM out there. Yes. There's like Minecraft STEM education. Well, and fortunately, the stigmatization behind games is getting, you know, demolished as we speak. So they're more accessible. Uh, and as long as the curriculum can keep up with what gets kids excited, I think there's going to be a, a big change and a big shift with how we teach using games. Another good uh, resource, if you uh, don't find a lot on Google, you can also check on Steam. Um, there are a lot of developers on Steam who make stories based off of specific things. Like I know there are games that um, basically teach history, but from the eyes of a character. Yeah. Um, so you can use, uh, if you have a Steam account, you can browse through there. There's a lot of free games or maybe like $1 games. Um, but there, I'm pretty sure there is like an education section. Steam is another good place to look. I wanted to move on to our last question. Um, and of course, it's it's the big one. This is if you had any item from a video game and it functioned exactly as in that game, what would you have? I think some <laughs> scribble knots. That's a really <laughs> yes. good suggestion. Yeah. If you okay. you'll have to explain to me because so, I don't know all of these, so you'll have to yeah. explain it. Because Scribble I'm knots, even... you could you could basically type out anything you wanted, and you could even like add adjectives to it, like a giant purple flying triceratops, and it would spawn that. There it is. <laughs> it's work with it works well with my artistic background. This infinite well of being able to manifest whatever I want. In, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> in the game, it was pretty glorious, too, because it was a very simple puzzle-solving mm -hmm. game. So you'd create rope, and then you'd create a weight, and then you'd use the rope and weight to lift up something, like a hatch, to get to the, the final endpoint. Uh, but then you'd get crazy, like, oh, I'm going to have a robber uh, and Superman, and then they will start battling. Just these chaotic nonsense things so that you fun. do in the game. It was, super, it was super cool, really fun. And then there's um, people who summon Cthulhu. Oh yeah, I, <laughs> you gotta summon the Cthulhu every chance. I I did some thinking about this, and I have a a mini replica. Uh, does anybody know what this is? Oh yeah, that's the uh, health meter from Goldeneye. It is the watch from yeah. Goldeneye, and I would love a real life version of this because not only could you do stuff like cloak and shoot lasers, <laughs> but I started thinking. Like you could load save files, so I could just like load a part oh. of my life and try and get a better score. I think it would be <laughs> glorious. Um, get dossiers, all sorts of fun stuff. Like some debug Voldemort menus. stuff right there. Yeah, I'm gonna hack the world. <laughs> I don't know. Can it be like a a creature? I would take Riven from Destiny, so she can give me anything I want. <laughs> just wish for all the like things. A yeah. <laughs> Technically cheating, but we'll allow it. <laughs> or or a portal gun. We're gonna be portal gun mm. definitely crossed portal my gun. mind. You could mm. yep. so I was I was thinking about that one. It, it wasn't my my where I finally ended up, but you could open a portal from like New York City to Hong Kong and charge, I don't know, five bucks, whatever, it's all profit. Um and great, you've just launched an enterprise and taken the world and shifted it on set. Instantaneous Cross planetary travel. I would love that because a nine hour flight to Japan was very long. Mm -hmm. So I'd like it to be eight <laughs> seconds instead. Yep. Um, I don't know that it counts. Like I had thought about it and I was thinking like a ghost mm. from Destiny. Oh. Um, but ghost is technically a character. So I don't know if it counts. <laughs> um, but I'll ghost, um, like your ghost, you can switch out your outfits in a flash like i'm just like oh i got juice all over my shirt snap new shirt <laughs> very um, accurate or you're like i'm done being stuck in this traffic call the spaceship i'm out of here <laughs> <laughs> that's um, fair and then if you get in some sort of bodily harm poof it's over you no longer have to deal with it so i mean like a ghost would seem pretty nice. And they're just a little floaty, happy robot friend. And they give you advice on things. 
pets and I, I would get consider that a pet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will robot buddies. I want the bananas from Mario Kart and I want them to work. <laughs> like anytime I throw one, I just want either a car or a person or a bike to just like <laughs> the one the one you specifically target. I mean, you might want a red shell instead. Uh, yeah, it's either banana or or a red shell from Mario Kart because traffic drives me nuts. So I'll just be like release the red shells. I like it. You have your priorities straightened out. I like it. Yeah, plus if you're hungry while waiting for traffic. There we go. Think, mm. Yeah, well, I guess you can't eat a banana peel. So I, I was considering, I had a, like, honorable mention to Frostmourne. Like, mm -hmm. I know you'd give up your soul, but you'd have unlimited control of the dead. That's pretty cool. I have a house <laughs> leather in here that definitely toots my horn. Um, but uh, I landed on an epic from uh chrono trigger the time traveling spaceship mm -hmm. uh mm. being able to visit i mean it's basically a tardis from a video game plus you can just take it for joy rides you don't have to use it for time travel exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> well we are about at the end of our time and i certainly learned a lot thank you so much for volunteering your time um and just helping keep the the nerd community the gaming community engaged and encouraged um during yeah, this probably. time we'll be talking soon um and uh hopefully we can have some of you back on either for for other videos or for our our event later this year keep on the main event that'd be awesome yeah Thanks, oh bye it. thank you, so you. Much. i had such a great nice time brand is just going off screen <laughs> 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 oh man well that was fun that was really fun that was that was a great conversation we have some special announcements thank you so much for joining us for episode eight it has been a crazy ride just seeing uh the people tune in every single week we do want to keep producing content for you during this time we're going to be moving to more of a pre-recorded format um, and doing it every other week but that doesn't mean that we're not going to be bringing on new exciting guests every time we post in fact if you still want to be able to be a part of our workshops or panels that we're doing you can join our discord chat how do you join your discord chat that's a great question chip we have a patreon now and i mentioned this before i wanted to take you guys to see our patreon page welcome to the king con live patreon page this is a page we created if you like what we're doing if you want to support us go visit our patreon page of course we have a discord chat so whenever i'm uh doing some pre-recorded content you'll be able to join in on the discord chat and ask questions that way we are still going to be offering some live events as uh special events we do have um, some really exciting live events planned for you. I will be posting on our Facebook page and our Instagram about the guests that I have coming up, asking for your questions in advance. You can get behind the scenes footage. So go give our, our page a look. We're moving in a great direction. We're gonna be able to provide some better content for you. Our next guest that we'll be filming with next week is Tim Pearson, the makeup artist and master sculptor. So I'll be posting a, a promotion about that so that you can give me your questions. You can also join in on the Discord while we're filming later this week. We really love it that you guys come and watch our content and uh, we'll see you again real soon. Bye. Hey everyone. Thanks for tuning in for another great episode. Don't forget, KingCon has an entire segment dedicated to gaming and esports. So if you wanna learn more about it, go to our website at kingconnw.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe.